Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest uh, vodcast. This is going to be on uh, GI applications in the acute abdomen, and I'm going to cover some interesting topics that perhaps you haven't thought about recently, but I think are very important. Now, if we just take a step back and go through some of the basics, what's an acute abdomen? Well, it's a clinical syndrome characterized by the sudden onset of severe abdominal pain requiring medical or surgical treatment in the emergency setting. So basically what we're dealing with is something that potentially can be a true crisis. We need to make and come up with an answer now. Abdominal pain is the most common cause for an ER visit overall, and second most common in patients over age 15, with chest pain being the most common. When you look at the acute abdomen, we obviously think about many things. Depending on the patient's age or sex, our differential diagnosis will indeed vary. Past medical history, whether you had prior surgery, whether you have a known neoplasm, when you have sickle cell disease, whether you have diabetes, all of those things are very important, as well as are you on medications? And if you're on medications, is it something new? Have you been on medications for 10 years, or is it something you've been on for three days? What are your symptoms? What about physical exam? Yes, we still do physical examination. What about lab studies? Have any then been done? Do you have an elevated Y count? Do you have a low platelet count? And of course, prior examinations are always critical. Obviously, you see something in the adrenal, you start thinking about a differential, but it was exactly the same five years ago. It's likely going to be a benign adenoma. The question about CT in the ER and its overuse is always something that comes up. Though I will admit lately it's not been such a noise factor, but my rule is when it's quiet, the next thing you're going to see is noise. In this article by Rosen way back when, uh, he made it very clear about the importance of CT, that it increased the physician's level of certainty, reduced the rate of hospital admissions, led to more timely surgery, ruled out significant disorders, and provided alternative diagnosis. It's amazing, just those numbers, and those are the things really that probably tell you you're not using enough CT, because look at its impact. And CT performed in the emergency department increases physicians' level of certainty, reduces hospital admission rates by 23.8%, and more timely surgical intervention. What more can a person ask for? Well, you fast forward a number of years, and there was an article from Mass General where they looked to determine, I mean, at the end of the day, they were trying to see whether there was good utilization of CT in the ER in the acute abdomen, in the non-trauma setting. And when they looked, the most common reasons for CT were renal colic and intestinal obstruction. But look how good CT did. 49% of patients, it altered the lead diagnosis. Certainty was increased from 70 to 92%. Management plan changed in 42%. Surgery was planned for 79 patients before CT, and a quarter of these patients were discharged after CT. Oh my goodness, look how great CT performed. And that was the author's conclusion. So why are we still asking the question? Well, perhaps it was because that was only one institution. Perhaps it was Mass General and the clinicians are better. But if the clinicians are better, why did they see the value of CT being so great? Other things we learned over the years, this article by Pooler made the point that if you're doing CT to rule out appendicitis, you're going to find appendicitis in a quarter of the cases but in 31% of the cases, you're going to find an alternative reason why the patient has symptoms. It makes the point again that we all know one of the great things about CT is it can pick up the diagnosis you may suspect as number one suspicion, but it can find many things that you weren't suspecting, which can be the cause of the patient's symptom. Also, if CT is negative, at the end of the day, it's really a source found that explains the patient's symptoms, and typically the symptoms will go away and the patient will do fine. So again, high sensitivity, high specificity, low false positive. In 704 patients for whom CT results did not suggest a specific diagnosis, the treating clinician did not arrive at a specific diagnosis 82% of the time. Every once in a while, they figure out something else. Maybe it wasn't on the exam, uh, but you can see the strength of CT. Now, you fast forward a few more years, and they wanted to redo the study looking at CT's impact, 
but instead of one institution, do it at multiple institutions. So nobody could say it was a single institution bias. In this multi-center study, they looked at many things in the ER. They looked at abdominal pain, chest pain, and headache. And you can see physicians changed their diagnosis across all three of these, but especially in the era of abdominal pain. Again, diagnostic confidence, admission decisions, all were more accurate after CT was performed. And so their conclusions were the same thing. These findings suggest that current ordering practices are clinically justified. So we are doing the right thing, and I always like to say perhaps we're not using enough CT. Now, when I look at specific causes for the acute abdomen, uh, I know that I've been in meetings where it's a three-day meeting in the days when we used to have meetings in person, and everything was the acute abdomen. So there's no way in uh, maybe an hour talk, which means three parts of this session, I'm not going to be able to go through everything. I could do an acute abdomen by going organ by organ, looking at liver abscesses, looking at the gallbladder and things like emphysematous cholecystitis, or looking at the spleen and looking at splenic abscesses, or looking at the bowel and seeing things like appendix epiploica. I could do that, but we're not going to do that. We're going to pick on several important topics and only focus on them. Again, recognizing there were so many things we can go through. And over time on CTSS, we've covered a number of these and we're covering more of them as we go forward over the next couple of years. Now, a key thing in the ER, as with all CT, is protocol. I think you need to give oral contrast on every patient. A lot of patients, water works very well. If you're not giving IV contrast, surely positive contrast is better. If you're looking for a perforation or ulceration, positive contrast is better. You always need IV contrast. So much of the pathology we see will only be seen with IV contrast. And of course, a lot of things we see are vascular related, so IV contrast is mandatory. And we like to inject three to five cc's per second, probably closer to five cc's. Now, in this article, and many like this, people always ask the question, do you need oral contrast? And the answer often is no. And I'm going to say that I disagree. I think by having oral contrast, and I'm not saying to wait an hour or two. I'm saying that even if you only waited 15 minutes, even if you gave the patient contrast when they were getting on the table, it distends the stomach and proximal bowel. How many times do you look at the abdomen and the stomach's not distended at all? And you can't say whether it is thickening of the stomach or it's normal, whether it's ulcer disease, whether it's inflammation. You can't say anything. The same thing in the duodenum. But if you give positive contrast or just give water, give 250 to 500 cc's when the patient's getting on the table, the stomach and small bowel will be distended and that will help you make the right diagnosis or at least avoid not making the wrong diagnosis in a significant amount of time. There have been several articles. Alec Megabo makes the point that they do give oral contrast. They wait 45 minutes, and it's attention to detail and insistence on the highest standards of quality and performance that are keys to productivity and efficiency, most certainly not through cutting corners. So Alec says it like it is. As radiologists, we owe it to our patients to drive the appropriate use of positive oral contrast. So says Perry Pinkert in Wisconsin. Perry's written some articles as well, as well on the topic, talking about, particularly in oncology patients, how you can miss things if you don't give oral contrast. And again, who's pushing not to give oral contrast? It's the bean counters. It's the people who aren't reading the CT. It's the people who know nothing. Okay? That's being politically correct, of course, in my view. We owe it to our patients. That's what Perry says, to do the right thing, and the right thing is giving oral contrast. Now, in terms of protocols, depending on the study, I will use single or dual-phase imaging. Most of the time, single-phase means venous phase, but sometimes rule out the section is single-phase arterial. For many things, we're going to use dual-phase imaging if you're looking for possible pancreatic disease or liver disease or splenic disease, uh, or ischemic bowel, or bleeding, we are doing dual-phase imaging. Except for stone disease, it's rare that we do non-contrast scans, and delayed-phase imaging typically is not very helpful, and we rarely do that. So, what are the topics I'm going to discuss? 
Well, one is GI bleeding. We've had talks before on GI bleeding, and you tend to focus on small or large bowel. I'm going to focus on everything coming down from the stomach. Now, acute GI bleeding is a common medical emergency, high number in the ER setting. Mortality is as high as 40% in patients with hemodynamic instability. The most bleeds will stop spontaneously, but will often recur, and that's especially true in diverticular disease. We talk about upper GI bleeding, which means proximal to the ligament of trites, and we talk about lower GI bleeding as distal to the ligament of trites. Upper GI bleeding, ulcer disease, varices, gastritis, duodenitis, malignancy. Lower GI bleeding, diverticulosis, diverticulitis, angiodysplasia in the colon and small bowel, colitis, occult malignancy, small bowel disease. So there's a wide range of things. Now, when we talk about upper GI bleeding, typically endoscopy is what's done. Endoscopy is good at making the diagnosis and also good at treatment, high sensitivity. But, you know, not all the time can you do upper GI series, or rather upper GI endoscopy, but you realize in the COVID era, no one wanted to do endoscopy, so CT became even more important. And in fact, when you think about it, if the patient has contraindications to endoscopy, if you don't have the time, again, CT the patient's in the ER already, or if you think CT may be more valuable, perhaps, it's the right study to do. When you look at the ACR appropriateness criteria for non variceal upper GI bleeding, classic angiography and CT both are rated eight, very, very high numbers. When you look at non variceal upper GI bleeding, post surgical and traumatic causes of non variceal bleeding with endoscopy contraindicated, Again, angiography, classic, is a nine, but CT comes very close with an eight, okay? CT is critical and can typically be used in place of classic angiography. Now, when you think about some of the things, the major complications of peptic ulcer disease, a perforation and bleeding, intraperitoneal free air is a major sign of perforation, intravenous contrast media extravasation is a sign of active bleeding, high content, density in the stomach with the suspicion of blood clots can also indicate recent bleeding, though of course we may not see the site of bleed. Although many reports have described CT findings of complicated peptic ulcer disease, the CT findings of uncomplicated peptic ulcer disease have not been well documented, and this article does talk about it. We've seen other articles on imaging. It can be difficult to distinguish benign peptic ulcer disease from malignant causes, Peptic ulcers can perforate and should be recognized on imaging. And again, the key to that is distending the stomach. So let's look at some examples. You can see the stomach is distended in this high density material. So I'm suspicious there's a bleed. You then see this air pocket kind of near the body of the stomach at the arrow. You then look at the coronal views. One of the big things is the coronal views which open up the stomach can be very helpful. Here it's much more obvious when you look, you see the patient's stomach wall, you see the break in the stomach wall, you see the break in the mucosa, you see the air bubbles. That's a patient with an ulcer with perforation, very nicely shown on these coronal views as well. And again, you could see as I go through the images, what a nice example of a perforated ulcer. Now there's no large mass present, so you can think, well, this probably is benign ulcer disease. There's no malignancy present. Though sometimes it can be tricky, but with when you really know it's malignant, when you see a mass present, when you don't see a mass, you don't see wall thickening, you can go with benign, but of course the patient will end up with endoscopy, so you'll know for sure. Here's just some more examples with 3D. Here's some examples showing you that was cinematic rendering, and we have been using cinematic rendering to look at gastric ulcer disease. The most recognized sign of uh, peptic ulcer disease on CT was high density gastric content. Again, you wanna be careful, you don't confuse this with ingested material, so you need to be very careful. Things like Maalox give high density material. Uh, in the emergency department of CT findings in patients with acute abdomen reveal high density gastric content, Acute peptic ulcer disease should be suspected since it's the most common cause of GI bleeding. Okay, so that becomes very important. And this article by Oyuna Agi makes that point.
you got to be thinking about ulcer disease and go from there. Here's another example. You can see the fluid and high density layering out in the stomach, but again, there's other reasons for high density. But now look at the posterior gastric wall. There's focal thickening. There's a break in the wall. So you know this ulcer disease. Could there be a mass present? Sagittal view very nicely shows that. I think the sagittal is particularly helpful for looking at the posterior gastric wall. And then we go to the cinematic. There's the wall thickening again. And again, here's that sagittal where there's the break in the wall. There's the wall thickening, ulceration. You would surely worry about in this case, could I be dealing with a malignancy? And then when I do the imaging in the stomach with cinematic rendering, you nicely see the ulcer. What's very important to recognize is that if we really do good distension of the stomach and do really good contrast injection, and we do really good lighting models with cinematic rendering, we can see the ulcerations in a way we could not see them before. So a beautiful look into the stomach, and Hannah Reck wrote this article that was actually published in Radiology showing this very nice example. Another case, wall thickening posteriorly, ulceration. In this case, I surely would worry about malignancy because the wall thickening is impressive. You see the ulceration very nicely seen. Again, the value of the sagittal imaging. There it is on the 3D mapping, looking inside the stomach and seeing the ulceration, with particularly well seen on the cinematic rendering, with the induration and ulceration all nicely appreciated. Again, peptic ulcer disease. Cinematic rendering is something new in the regard to the stomach. We've published one article, but you can see there's lots we potentially can publish because this is a really good technique perhaps for looking at superficial gastric ulcers. It may become very valuable for looking at subtle gastric cancers. Again, we need to optimize the technique, but you can see the possibilities seem to be endless. Now, of course, we always have unusual things. Here's a patient with an enhancing lesion in the antrum of the stomach. Could this be a carcinoma? Could this be active bleeding? But it looks kind of like a polypoid type mass but it's very bright. That would surely be the source of the patient's bleeding. Here it is again on the volume rendering. There's some prominent vessels off the GDA. Really impressive. It looks like, could this be an AV malformation? There's so many vessels present there. That would be a good thought. You can see once it washes out on venous phase imaging, you see the wall thickening, but those prominent vessels tend to disappear. And that was a great case. It's an unusual entity gave gastric antral vascular ectasia, a rare entity with unique endoscopic appearance described as a watermelon stomach. Uh, it's very unusual in terms of CT, but it's just a beautiful appearance of a cluster of enhancement looking almost like a vascular malformation, which in some sense that's what it is, but the location is indeed classic, more common in women, uh, associated with cirrhosis, and achloridia. The usual symptoms are iron deficiency anemia and melana due to chronic GI bleeding. Entrectomy is curative. Just a wonderful, wonderful case. Now, I mentioned about cancer and the difficulty of picking up cancer at times, particularly when the lesion is subtle. Here's a good example of obvious high density material in the stomach, then a very bright area. You can see I circled it in the posterior wall. And then as you go from arterial to venous phase imaging, you can see the jet of contrast coming from the ulceration and that ulceration with, within a gastric cancer. Just a really beautiful example. And here's another case with a perforation. This was a perforated malignant ulcer. Again, going back through the images, you see the free air, you see the inflammation, there's lots of thickening. I have to admit, I would worry about a possible malignancy, surely it was an older patient, but you can't always be certain because wall thickening and inflammation shows the wall to be thick. The presence of perforation can be with a malignant or a benign ulcer. So again, endoscopy is going to be the way to go. Here on the 3D, you kind of appreciate the diffuse wall thickening of the lesser curvature. It looks pretty impressive compared to the greater curvature. And here, the way it looks, I would say this is malignant. There's the free air tracking up toward the lesser sac and toward the liver edge. And of course, you can see that as well. It's a good call on the patient's uh, you know, topogram. We have almost a double bubble present. Now, 
Antral cancers, here's another example. Wall thickening of the antrum, there's the ulceration. Now, one thing I'm going to say about gastric cancer and spread, we always look at the perigastric tissues to look for spread. One thing to remember and be very careful, once you have an ulceration with perforation, there's always stranding in the perigastric tissues. It doesn't mean this tumor spread. And the second thing is when the patients have deep biopsies, you can get stranding beyond the stomach, which can simulate perigastric spread. But this is a nice infiltrating tumor, um, adenocarcinoma of the stomach, shown very nicely again as you look at the patient's cinematic rendered images. So a really good look at showing you that. Now, that's the stomach. Now, when you think about the stomach, again, think about the possibility of GI bleeding. The key is protocol. The key is good gastric distension. The same concepts we t think about in the stomach, we think about in the small bowel. But what we're going to do is let's take a break and come right back and do the small bowel. See you in a moment. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.